Um, hi, everyone. Thanks for joining. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Um, I'm Tomiko. I am in, currently, I am doing a stretch assignment in the data communications team in BAPM. And it's a bit strange because uh, my normal role is digital capacity building in GCA, and I facilitate a lot of webinars. So uh, I have a lot of experience in facilitating webinars, but this is my very first time presenting in webinar. But it's really good to see so many of you here today. Thank you. Um, and I want to go around the room, I guess, so to speak, uh, introducing ourselves. So maybe Caroline, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes. Hello, everybody. It's good to see a lot of familiar faces and a lot of new names. Also, my name is Caroline Hasfeder. Um, I am part of the Division of Data Analytics, Planning and Monitoring, and in particular, the Data Analytics Data Communications team, a very small team. And part of our work is to um, make our data used for programs and advocacy. And uh, a very important part of that, or a part that we feel particularly passionate about, is data visualization and data storytelling. Um, so I'm very lucky to have Tomiko um, there to, to help me with that, and uh, Cha Long, who is our intern on data visualization as well. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll we'll have this, uh, you know, pretty informal, but I think uh, interesting and educational series of webinars in the coming months. Uh, we are really looking forward to hearing what works, what you're interested in. Uh, this is not supposed to be like a dry meeting that you have to attend, but hopefully we, we'll be building a little bit of a community again. Um, and um, yeah, the themes will partly reflect also what, what we hear back from you. So uh, with that, over to Chalong. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Chao Longling and uh, currently I'm working as a data visualization and communication intern for Caroline's team. And I joined the unit, uh around three months ago and uh, I worked on uh, data visualization of different uh, charts, dashboards, and uh, which I found very interesting. So uh, I, and I am glad that I have the chance to join the meeting and uh, talk to everyone and share something interesting about uh, data, data, data visualization. Thank you. Great, thank you. So I'm gonna start um, sharing my slide. Is it in presentation mode now? Yeah. So as Caroline said, this is very informal. We just wanna, uh, we wanted to start the session. And um, as we were brainstorming what to do for the very first inaugural session, um, we thought this would be a good way to sort of um, break ice, so to speak. Um, so this isn't really a um, formal presentation. It's really, um, it's, you know, it's about the history of database, but it's nothing um, substantial to be honest. It's more of an icebreaker, so and also to gauge your interest and um, level of knowledge. So, um, and also um, everyone right now, all the attendees right now is muted and you can't really speak up. So if you have any questions, put it in Q and A or chat. And I see a lot of you introducing yourselves in the chat, which is great. So please continue to do that. And if you need me to repeat anything, let me know. Um, Caroline is also helping me monitor all the comments. So. So this, as I said, is a very brief introduction uh, to the history of DataViz. Um, I'm going to focus on three sort of historical figures that are known in the DataViz world. Um, and uh, I'm gonna start with uh, Florence Nightingale, who you probably know as um, with her work in the, as a nurse, uh, she served as, a uh, nursing administrator during the Crimean War in the British Army Hospital Network. So I think she's mostly known as a nurse, but she was also a skilled statistician. She studied uh, mathematics, which was kind of uncommon uh, for women in her um, during that era in the 1800s, but uh, she became really uh, adept in creating database. And she used that, she used her analytical skills and data vis creating data vis skills to advocate for better wash conditions in the British military hospitals. Um, and in the data vis world, she's, she's very known for this uh, 
chart or diagram, which is known as Rose's diagram. Um, this she used this to sort of substantiate uh, that more soldiers, British soldiers, um, fell victim to unsanitary conditions and preventable diseases in the army hospital than from the Russian bullets. And in this diagram, the blue wedges, these these wedges, represent death by infectious diseases. And the red or the, the pink uh, wedges um, represent death from the battle wounds and the black ones from other uh, causes. And here you can see like the number of deaths redu uh, being reduced because uh, Nightingale advocated for uh, better wash conditions in, in these hospitals and the British government actually sent um, a commission to clean up the unsanitary conditions in the hospitals. And this chart shows the reduction of death rate after the commission was sent. Um, And she also, but she also created other, like more straightforward uh, data bins, like this bar chart. Um, so this one represents, I think, the the comparison of death rates uh, between the, the British Army soldiers and um, regular average English men uh, after they come back from war. So she she showed that uh, more former soldiers died than an average British man. But I have to sort of mention, um, reading about this, uh, reading about the Rose chart, this chart, um, apparently there are some evidence that Nightingale, um, or the Rose chart doesn't tell an honest story because, um, so it, it seems like there is a drastic reduction in death rate after the commission arrived at the hospital, but actually um, by the time they arrived, the death rate had already been uh, falling sharply for a couple of months. So I just have to mention it, you know, just to be fair. Um, and there are a lot of um, these two um, resources are really great reading. Uh, uh, the Good Data Project, which is a great uh, website for database. Um, talks about how sort of Nightingale sort of manipulated the data to sort of tell, to tell a story that she wanted to tell. And there is a great uh, podcast on 99% um, Invisible, which is a great podcast series to begin with. Um, so if you're interested, um, you can check these out. And we'll, we'll be sharing this slide after the webinar so you can uh, refer to these resources later. So the second historical figure is John Snow. Who, is, who was an English physician, and he's widely viewed as the father of contemporary ep epidem epidemiology, <laughs> which is the, uh, I think, the study of infectious diseases, I believe. Um, and he's best known for, um, his best known work includes uh, his in investigation of Broad Street water pump outbreak in London. Um, so he mapped, the water pumps in Soho area in London, um, because there was a cholera outbreak at the time in, in the mid 1800s in London, and he mapped the water pumps in this area of London, and then also um, graphed death by cholera in that area. So this is, this is um, sort of an enlarged section of this map, and he, made a correlation between uh, the people dying from cholera and this particular water pump on Broad Street. So it was, this was significant in that it, he not only identified the, the source or the water pump that was causing all the cholera outbreak, uh, but it led to the general understanding of how cholera spread um, because it was sort of believed that it was airborne before that. So it, he contributed in like clarifying the, how, how cholera spreads, it's through the contaminated water. So that was a very significant uh, finding. Um, so he's mostly known for this uh, investigation. So Miko, sorry, I'm just coming in here for a second. I have a comment about your microphone, your audio quality. Oh, okay, um, sorry. I don't know if there's any change that you can make. I have the same issue. Okay. Oh, sorry. You can't oh, hear me at all? 
No, 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 we can hear you. Just, just okay. a little choppy sometimes. Sorry, maybe, maybe I just have to hold it like this. Sorry. Um, should I repeat what I just said about John Snow? Um, I think it's fine. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah. Tomiko, can you turn on subtitles, I think? That's another request here. Oh, okay, sure. Um, subtitles and settings. Thank you all for the comments. I thought it was just my issue. Captions. Show captions. Can you see that now? Or, um, I don't know. Yeah. yeah, and maybe move a little closer to the microphone also. So maybe I'll just hold it like this. <laughs> I think that's better. Yeah, that's better. Okay. Yes, yes, that's better. Thank okay. you so much. Sorry for interrupt. No. All right. So I don't need to repeat about John Snow. Is that okay with everyone? There's an option to turn on subtitles. And stuff. Okay, I see a thumbs up, so I'm going to move forward. So the next um, database historian is W.E.B. Dubois. So he is um, a Black American sociologist and civil rights advocate, and he's a co-founder of NAACP. Um, and he's known as a pioneer of data visualization in the U.S. in the late 19th century. Um, he created DataViz about the progress made by Black Americans or African slaves after the emancipation for the 1900 World Fair in Paris. Um, so this is actually his, apparently his path to enter the World Fair. Um, so he, he opened the exhibit with this map of African slave trade routes, which was the first, um, and it, it, this is very creative, like it's very visually stunning. Um, and not to mention this was all hand drawn, obviously, you know, they didn't have database tools like Infogram back then. So you can see um, the people that, you know, the African population being uh, moved to certain parts of North and uh, South America and also the Caribbeans. Uh, so these colors and th these lines sort of, you can see how, um, oops, sorry. They were moved from where to where. Um, and this was, and the star on the map is, uh, represents Georgia, which was a big hub at the time in the US. Um, and the next one is also a map which I think is very, very sophisticated, to be honest, because it really shows the um, movement of people. It's not just a map, but like how people migrated uh, from Georgia. So this one, I think, shows a uh, migration of Black Americans or uh, uh, former African slaves born in Georgia to other states in the US. Uh, so you can kind of, I don't know if you can see these numbers and um, arrows. Um, and then this map represents, um, are you guys seeing my cursor? Oh no, am I cursoring over a wrong window maybe? Yeah, okay. So, uh, so this map represents um, the blacks born in Georgia moving to other states in the US. And this map represents blacks born in other states in the US moving to Georgia. So these, so like, I think this is Texas, um, 99 people moving to Georgia. Um, and then the next one, so this is, so all of his plates, um, all of his data viz, I have a book of his data visualizations and all of them are very, very visually stunning, like colors and the creativity of it. So like something like this, like this is very, um, it's almost like abstract art, you know? Um, Color-wise, it's very pretty. And this, um, the one on the right represents a black population living in cities versus rural areas in the US in 1890. So the green line uh, represents um, blacks living in cities over 10,000 inhabitants. So it, this, the, the green line represents black people living in a very large city at the time. And the blue line is for cities uh, with 5,000 to 10,000 inhabitants. And the yellow line is for cities, blacks living in cities with 
2,500 to 5,000 inhabitants in the red um, line. Oops, sorry. Red line uh, represents um, black people living in uh, in the country and villages. And this chart, this uh, graph on the left, uh, rep represents the proportion of uh, freed uh, slaves versus uh, people who were slaves um, over time. So uh, the 13th Amendment was passed in December 1865 in the US to abolish slavery. So like after that point, technically, legally, every person was a uh, free man, so to speak. Um, and, you know, as I look through, so I have this book of his data viz, and as I look through the book, all of them are very beautiful, but as I said, they're all hand-drawn. And sometimes I feel like it's just kind of impossible to replicate some of these in like infograms or any data viz that we have today, data viz tools that we have today. And as I was thinking that, Caroline shared the Flourish newsletter uh, in which they replicated some of, some of his uh, data viz using Flourish, which is a data visualization tool that you can use. So I have a link to that newsletter and how they did it. So if you want to try and you know, try it yourself, I think it would be fun. And this uh, chart on the left is one of the charts that they recreated in Flourish. So I think it would be a fun exercise. Um, and also this is really for people, uh, colleagues who are in New York or who will be visiting New York before the end of May, but Cooper Hewitt Museum is having an exhibit on W.E. Du Bois' uh, data visualization. Um, at, uh, that were exhibited at the World Fair. So um, if you want to go check it out, I think that would be fun too. I mean, it's a really good museum uh, in general, so I think it's worth visiting. So I, that's the end of my history of data visit presentation, um, and I'm going to hand the mic over to uh, Caroline to talk us through a little bit about the process of requesting uh, licenses for Infogram. Mm -hmm. Good. Thank you so much, Tomiko. This is fascinating. And I, I didn't know some of this. And, and um, I personally am also interested in, in just reading about the impact these visualizations had on society afterwards and at that time, because that was so novel and groundbreaking. Like We're a little bit more used to this now, but back then it must have made a tremendous difference. Um, but um, And I'm seeing lots of hearts and claps for you. So um, hopefully this is the uh, this is a format that uh, people are interested in. And maybe I think the idea is that um, our audience also comes out, comes up with, with similar um, inspirational things, whether they're modern or whether they're from a past or whether it's something that has made a difference in your country. Uh, that's really what we're looking for. Um, okay, without further ado, I'll just spend a couple minutes on um, a few things that people have already asked about here in the chat also. So um, mainly with regards to tools um, about how we can build data visualizations. Um, so uh, we manage um, licenses for a tool called Infogram. It is a relatively easy to use tool to create maps, charts, graphs, um, interactive, but also static um, in various formats. There are UN um, conform, the maps are UN conform um, and um, there is UNICEF branding built in almost. Um, and uh, we have a limited number of licenses, um, which comes out to about two per country office and a little bit more for regional offices. But, um, but, but we have some flexibility. Um, if you're interested, I know many of you are already using it because we invited the, the users, but if you're interested in, in trying that out, um, you can uh, submit a request via our evidence help desk, and we'll share the link for that. Um, we uh, have an ambition to, to then respond to that within 48 hours. Also, any other kind of data or evidence-related questions, you can submit through there. Um, we also have an infogram training library so that you can learn how to use these tools and see some examples from other countries. Um, and that is particularly helpful because if you see an example from other countries, uh, we can we can put that in your team library as a as a template. So a lot of the work uh, will then already be done, and you can just customize it for your for your context. Um, we also have a data visualization community of practice on Yammer, 
um, a link link is there. Maybe some of you heard about this over now here there, but we'll also put these great resources that that Tomiko had um, in there. And uh, then we have a data for children community in Yammer, which is a little bit broader than just data visualization, but uh, but we hope you can join both. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that's uh, that's it. If uh, we we have we we can do customized learning sessions for tools um, also in the future. But I think Tomiko has some plans to to learn a little bit more about your interests um, uh, later in the in the session. So let me just see if there's any. Uh, yes, there's uh, quite a few other, I'm glad you're mentioning it, Daniel, quite a few other free data viz tools uh, like Excel, R, Python. Um, there's also Flourish, um, which I mentioned earlier, which um, is, is actually um, a great tool, a little bit of a higher learning curve, but not much. So so I think, uh, yeah, in, I'm mentioning Infogram in particular because um, especially for those that are communication officers, it is um, one of the few tools that is uh, that that can be embedded that is approved by digital governance um, to be used on on the Drupal websites. Um, mainly also because uh, we have the UN conform uh, maps. Um, here are two very quick examples um, of of things that we have created on Infogram. The left one is um, interactive. I actually both are interactive. You can't really see it here right now. Um, so a map uh, with some infographic elements um, and uh, color scheme uh, that actually, um, when you see it, um, kind of flows into the website. And the other one is um, the uh, one of the pages on the Icaro UNICEF.org page. Um, it's I'm I'm bringing that up because we're getting a lot of these requests. Uh, it's kind of like on the interface between program and uh, communication. So. Uh, it's basically a way to highlight a certain uh, country, but also do a subnational area, and then at hover, show some text and then show a click to say uh, a human interest story or another page or a PDF. So it kind of like helps you in, I would say, almost information management um, in a digital way. So it's another use case for, for Infogram where I see a lot of requests for, so I wanted to mention that. But um, I won't take more of your time here. I think, Tomiko, you have um, some more plans um, before we open yeah. up the panel. Um, actually, there is one question. Uh, oh, OK. Mia, can I access the infogram to practice? How do I access Flourish? So, sorry, can you put your microphone closer? Um, sorry. <laughs> um, she's asking, Mia is asking if, uh, if she can access infogram to practice, and how does she access Flourish? Uh, yes, so we don't have an enterprise version for uh, account for for Flourish. Um, so you could actually create a free account on Flourish. Um, for Infogram, um, submit a request to the evidence help desk, and then we can um, assign you a license uh, for testing even just for a couple months. Um, you could also do a free account on Infogram, but I wouldn't recommend it because then you don't get the maps and the the UNICEF branding. So even for practicing, I think it's it's good. Uh, plus, you'll see the work of other people, which might be um, helpful and, and inspiring. Other people from UNICEF. Hope that answered the question. Cool. So I put the, all the references or the resources that I use to create the presentation so that you can also look at it yourselves. Um, and that's it. Thank you. This is the, the end of the presentation portion. I'm going to stop sharing. Um, So I think we want to go into show and tell portion. Uh, I hope some of you have brought your favorite database. Um, and I brought one, but since I've been talking a lot, maybe someone else can go. <laughs> Carolina Chalong. Happy to give Chalong the floor. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Maybe I I can share uh, the one dashboard I designed for our UNICEF Zimbabwe's office. I designed recently, and uh, I can share my idea. Okay. Uh, can you see my screen? Cool. Okay. Uh, 
This is one dashboard uh, we designed recently for our UNICEF Zimbabwe's office. And the objective is that uh, because uh, there are a lot of indicators at the country level. And uh, so we, uh, they, uh, they have a need to like to visualize all these indicators in a much more simple and easier way for audience to understand. So uh, from my side, so, uh, I designed a, a dashboard through Tableau to, because I think Tableau is also a, a, a very powerful visualization tool that, that could help us to do some, to visualize chats, to visualize, uh, to design dashboards. So uh, what I did, so we like, uh, did, uh, the, 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 the key structure of the dashboard is divided. Uh, there are three steps. So we can, first we categorize all our indica indicators into 12 uh, categories. So we can click any one category, then we'll filter the data on the rest of the dashboard. And then click one, then we will, in step two, we can read all or indicators at this uh, within this category, then we can quickly to understand okay the the latest uh, data uh, for each indicator, and then clicking uh, either uh, either clicking the country in the bar chart, or you can also uh, choose one uh, one indicator you want to understand more. Then you can to go deep dive to understand. Uh, uh, a more detailed aggregation at, for this indicator. Then, for example, here on the left side, we can see because according to the need from the mobile office, they want to show see the data in a specific dimension. So here we can uh, I have a drop down list. So we allow us to filter the data, the chat by a different dimension. And uh, on the right part, we can see the comparison uh of the indicate for this for example the under five mortality rate at region regional level and first sometimes we have to uh, think about the best chart for the for for visualization this kind of data because at first we use the map for the for visualize the data but things now we have like more than uh, two years data so to make the best, uh, to deliver a better comparison of our data. So we have to think about if any, any other way to uh, visualize that uh, data. So currently I, we figure out to use the dot plot, which will be easier to make comparison and also to see the trend and the to uh, at a different regional level. Yeah, and that's one I, we, I did uh, recently. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chalong. And I think that is live on the Zimbabwe homepage yeah. right now, right? Yeah. MSF Zimbabwe page? Yeah. Okay, that's great. Yeah, that was uh, developed together with our Frontier Data and Tech team. So yeah. um, that's uh, one of the, I think, the second or third country office that is taking advantage of of this collaboration. Um, yeah. And uh, Chalong did really wonderful work there. So to Miko, I don't know if you want to open it up to to others. Um, yeah. To... Um, does anyone want to share your favorite database? It doesn't necessarily have to be on UNICEF website. It, it could be anything that you saw somewhere. You know, there are a lot of great, like nowadays, like media, news media. Uh, outlets doing um, excellent data visualizations. So um, if you do want to show um, your favorite database, could you use the raise hand functionality? Because I, I think I have to promote you to panelists in order to share your screen and unmute yourself. So um, while we wait, I can share my favorite. So this is uh, on our on data.unicef.org website, and it's a publication page, publication landing page, and um, but it has it's about this um, learning, like how children are actually learning, and it has this. Uh, this is actually a forest chart, 
um, you can toggle between the reading skills and numeracy skills. And you can see how, um, how each country um, that have data are faring. And you can see the median and um, in certain, you know, which, which region they're in. Um, I think this, this is a quite, it's a pretty straightforward chart. Um, it's a, just a bar chart, but it's very easy to understand. And um, it's nice, like Flourish um, sort of allows these sort of toggling, toggle feature, and which makes it interesting to um, see. I think we have somebody here, uh, Paula. You yeah. um, just put in a link. Maybe, would you be Would you be up for telling us um, why this is your favorite yeah. database? Would you be interested or comfortable? Yeah, maybe I'll. Oh, I think she's. Us. Oh, yeah, she's up first. Yeah, go please. Um, you should be able to speak now. Can you try? Yeah, there you go. Hi, Paula. Hey everyone, um, I don't know if you can if you can see it already. I'm um, I'm really into database in in the last months or year, and and so I I love it that you could uh, make a database uh, webinar to share some uh, good practices within UNICEF. Um, but I really like this uh, visualization. It's it's uh, very sophisticated and it shows the casualties. Uh, uh, in, Paul, in, Paula, in, yes. You, I don't see you sharing screen though. No, I'm sorry. Oh. Could, could you share it? Because oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. on my phone. Oh, I see. Okay. So and if and I, if you share it, I I can explain. Oh yeah. Okay. Sure. Cool. Um, this one. Yes. Yeah. That one exactly. Yeah. Um. So it's it's very usually stunning, and it shows the the casualties in different wars and in different regions. So the colors uh, represent different regions of the world, and it also shows um, the length of these wars. So let's say the root of the flower of the poppy is when the war started, and the actual flower is when it ended. So. Uh, the bottom line is is like a timeline, and 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 it gives you an impression of 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 how, of the depth of the situation. And and for example, World War Two, which which was massive, and World War One. Um, I think it I think it wasn't done with an actual tool. It was just I'm guessing Illustrator and just having the idea and the vision for what they wanted it to look like um it's it's very sophisticated but uh i think it's it's visually stunning yeah it's really nice it's really and it's kind of i don't know it's flowers like you don't really associate with death but um yeah you know. i think that in the in the maybe someone british can Correct me, but I think in the UK the poppy uh, is associated with World War One, oh, okay. so this kind of flower. But I don't want to. Okay, someone said. Someone yes. said yes. <laughs> so <laughs> I think you're right. In that. Yeah. Um, and Stephanie is saying the poppy symbolism is amazing as it bears great significance for Remembrance Day. I don't know what what remember. I guess it's a holiday or. Um, they're, they wear it every November. Huh? Yes. Wow, I didn't know that. That's great. Yeah, actually, it's it's uh, on the on the lower part. It says something about that. The remembrance. Oh yeah, poppy. the remembrance poppy commemorates soldiers who have died in. This is great. Thank you, Paula. Oh, no, yeah. you're welcome. Thank Glad you. I could share. <laughs> yeah. It's inspirational. Um, Thanks. Yes, thank you. Um, so I think a few others shared links. So should I maybe sh keep sharing the screen and allow people to talk so that I can sort of navigate through the different um, sites? 
Okay. I think that sounds good. Yes, that's yeah. probably the easiest. Yeah. I think so, Sylvia, you had something. Would you be up for for talking yeah. about it? So one sec. I need to unmute her. Sylvia Sanchez. I need to properly spell her name. Yeah. Sylvia, can you talk? Let's give her a second. I think you should be able to unmute yourself now. Or can we, um, at this point, can we switch the format to open it to everybody without being a panelist? Or is that not possible? Yeah, I can. I I should be able to unmute everybody. Yeah, just unmute everybody. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Okay. Hmm? Oh, you can't unmute? Oh, okay. No, I don't know why. Uh, sorry. I'm just, I have, apparently I have to do this one by one. Sorry, guys. Oh. <laughs> yeah. And fortunately, there are a lot of you, so. Yeah. Okay. So, fine. Um, in so, so, in Sylvia, you can't talk? Okay, maybe while we figure this out, I see that uh, Lauren Francis, who also works in the data analytics team, shared um, a Tableau data visualization. Lauren, would you be up for showing that quickly? Lauren. Okay. Um, Lauren, I can show Yes, oh, yeah. I, can, I can speak. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, just let me get it up. So let me, Lauren, let me load your database. This? Countdown to 2030? Yes, because the, oh. the regional profiles. Cool. So, uh, yeah, so um, last year, the uh, health and HIV team in UNICEF headquarters created the uh, countdown to 2030 profiles and we uh, produced a series of country profiles for all uh, low and middle income countries and we did this in collaboration with uh, University of North Carolina and North Carolina State Universities uh, and this year we've newly produced the regional profiles so it pulls all the countries together. Um, it's it shows a series of health related indicators. Um, I think it's I think it's 103 indicators in these profiles. And um, yeah, there's one for each region. It, if you scroll to the top, we have uh, down a little bit, we have a, a, a map showing the composite coverage index um, for the different countries in West and Central Africa. And this is a index made of uh, eight uh, tracer indicators to give an overall composite index. Um, we also have tables in this data visualization. So the tables are showing the demographic data at the top. We have line charts um, for uh, mortality rate. So this shows the regional mortality rate with the 95% confidence interval, but you can change it to at the top where it says level, you can change it to country. And it will show you the value, the the mortality rates, uh, child mortality rates for all the different countries. But obviously, here there's a lot going on. So in the next filter, you can change um, in the one where it says, or you can select which countries you want to look at. So this enables you to compare um, one or multiple countries with each other, as well as compare it with the um, the regional value below, with the regional value which is Western Central Africa, which is right at the bottom. Uh, we also have a chart from maternal mortality ratio. So again, there's lots of different options. You can look at the regional maternal mortality. You can look at uh, maternal mortality by country. You can look at the countries by rank. 
and also the cause of death like there's so many things that we probably won't go over at all but just to show like the different types of data visualizations we've managed to fit on in just one page um, and then to the right we have the top five causes of death for children but you can also increase it to I think it's up to 10 causes of death um, Oh, oh yeah. 14 causes of death. So you can add as you can look at as many or as few as you want. Um, and then if we scroll back to the top, there are the this the countdown uh, regional profiles are split over three pages. So currently we're on one, and then we've got second page and third page. Wow. Um Again, um, different filters. Mm -hmm. So for the immunization, you can look at um, different vaccines uh, that have been selected for the countdown profiles. And again, you can uh, filter for countries. There are fewer countries with HPV because a lot of them haven't introduced it yet. Um, we can oh. look at proportion as there it is children. We have equity charts as well if we scroll down a little bit. Um, so the continuum care equity chart is basically showing uh, maternal and child health indicators um, disaggregated by uh, wealth. So we're looking at the richest and the poorest 20% of the population within these countries, and you can see um, the equity gap between them. Uh, we've so got great, indicators, that bar chart, we've got loads of stuff. Um, so yeah, please feel That is uh, excellent. Please, check it out. That's amazing, Lauren. Thank you. Yeah, this is a lot, a lot of things that you fit into this. What I'm interested in is also... Um, how are um, how are people using this dashboard? Do you know any specific use cases um, for it that that you've learned about, and how are you how are you finding out um, you know what what in particular is is helpful, or how to fine tune this dashboard for the future? So this is this is useful for anyone um, who's working in health. Um, so it brings all of the different health indicators together, and this is a big um, like collaborative. Mm -hmm. uh, project with different uh, multiple organizations and institutions um, and the idea is it can be used for people in country offices regional offices and also governments as well um, for people to be able to compare how their country is doing with other countries in the region and because you can download it in a pdf um, you can have a static version uh, if you don't have internet connection all right thank you so the idea, so to refine it, the idea is to add a fourth page, which is going to be a region specific page, and then that will have indicators that are related to specific regions. Um, and this is things like malaria and things which will, which won't necessarily be relevant to all regions. Um, that that those indicators will go on this fourth region specific page. Got it. Got it. Yeah, that is that is very good. Um, I. Um... Yeah, when, when I look at dashboards like this, I, I, um, I'm always so impressed by the wealth of information, but sometimes I'm, I'm also a little bit overwhelmed by it. So, um, but, but uh, I think it's, it's great to see. And um, I think it's a really great applied case for how especially our data can be used for, for informing programs and, and collaborations. So um, great work, Lauren. Thank you for, thank you for taking the time and, and sharing with, with us all. Um, I I saw a few questions now, probably five or six, about Power BI versus Tableau and resources, mm -hmm. more resources about Power BI. So I feel like we might not be the best team equipped to um, give like a detailed view of this. Um, to my best knowledge, um, Microsoft Power BI um, and and Tableau are both both dashboard tools um, on the on the exploratory side. So for like a deep dive. Um, Infogram is more on the explanatory, you know, Flourish too, you know, kind of like more uh, what you see is what you get. Um, and, and yes, uh, Power BI is the UNICEF uh, is tool of choice, right? We have, we are bought into the Microsoft system. So that's, that's what we're encouraged to use, especially for, for our internal data and personally identifiable data and, and everything. Uh, so, so yes, it is true that, that um, the data analytics team sometimes uses Tableau uh, that, also is because of the data being mostly external facing for the public. Um, and I think, um, I mean, I'm not, I'm not gonna make a blanket statement here, but um, I have heard people say that, that it has uh, a few more visual possibilities. Um, 
that uh, that work they also work well with our our API to our data warehouse. Um, so in terms of in terms of resources and training, I saw Kion put some great resources in the chat. Uh, Daniel too. Those two seem to be a little bit more experts in in using that. I I haven't used Power BI that much myself. I have to say. So if anybody, if if one of the two or anybody else um, would like to to help colleagues out here, you know, I really doesn't have to be a, a presentation just by our team. It's 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 about um, exactly these kind of connections and helping each other. That'd be great. So um, Kion, Daniel, anybody who would like to. Tell us more about resources for Power BI. Uh, I think also there's somebody called Antonio Vaca Flores. Um, I think he's an ICDD. Uh, there's a business intelligence team. Uh, I don't know if he's on here. Um, if not, maybe we can invite him for one of the future sessions. So um, that's that's pretty much what I know about the topic here. Um, Keon, um, can we quickly give you the floor? Is that okay? Sure. Um, can everybody Great. hear hear yeah. me? Okay. Thanks yeah, so much, you. Tomiko and uh, Caroline. For uh, this session has been so fascinating and it's so wonderful to put data visualization in a historical context. And it feels like it's you know almost like a human instinct. By the way, uh, just to see you know like data visually, that was my you know reaction to you. Thanks so much. And um, so one. One um, advantage of Power BI, as Caroline mentioned, is that you know the Microsoft tools and suites are Unisub's like default options now. So I, but then, hence uh, there is more inherent connectivities with Unisub data through Power BI. So it, on the page that Tomiko is showing, if you, for instance, go to um, the rightmost column in the second like. Quick reference guides data, the, the second um, heading in, in gray. Yes, yeah, so connect to Power BI data set, connect to an inside cube. So if you connect, uh, if you click on one of those links, it's essentially like a step by step guide. So you can connect to the existing Power BI data sets that ICTD colleagues have built for us, which means that you can pull any like financial cube data or even RAM data from a country office uh, standpoint. You can pull in your country office RAM outcome and output narratives, standard indicators, additional indicators, and build basically build a dashboard. So that is that um, backend connection is already there. Is for anyone with UNICEF, like anyone can like, you know, connect to it and build a dashboard of your own. So I think that is a, a strength of Power BI. I'm not so sure if such a connection exists for other data visualization tools. But again, as Caroline mentions, um, ICTD BI team, uh, Alfonso Vaca Flores, he is uh, the colleague that I would go to if I have any queries. And I see uh, UNICEF training materials in the second column on the top, you know, uh, training in Budapest, U uh, New York, Nairobi. So I'm pretty sure those are the training materials and with uh, PowerPoints and recordings that um, you can refer to. So that's uh, a little bit from my side over. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kion. Uh, we'll definitely include this link uh, in the follow-up email so that those of you who are interested in wanting to learn Power BI, we, you can do that. Um, so I think Sylvia can unmute herself now. So do, Sylvia, would you like to um, talk a little bit about your um, favorite database? I know you, it's um, the Times um, has been doing an amazing yeah, job. Well, yeah. So go ahead. I'm gonna just uh, gonna oh, tell you short um, about oh, these these maps that I really liked. Here are not looking so appealing now because this is like um, the archive from the New York Times. But during the elections, these maps were a very sorry. graphical, um, and you could like interact with the map. Um, Sylvia, see. would you would yeah. you like to share your screen? I I'm not logged into the time site with on this like work oh. computer, so I can't really show. Can, I can we share? Ah, yeah. Um. So I stopped sharing. So if you can share, I don't know if you can show your database on your uh, computer. 
here I am. Uh, let me share my screen. Okay, here it is. Great. We see um, it. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, well, I think this is not what I was looking at, or maybe this, well, here, these maps and um, the New York Times in general, they have like a very good follow-up of, of crisis or political situations and the elections in the US is one of those examples. So um, as, as I mentioned, this is the archive from the elections and you can uh, like compare, but what is interesting about these maps and what I really liked about it is that you can interact with them. And during the elections, it was like a great tool to follow up what was happening. Um, these are not only maps, but uh, they also have graphs and uh, timelines. Uh, and well, uh, they also have it um, are responsive. So you can see it from your phone and that was that was great for me so well it's not <laughs> uh, uh yeah so um, this is it I am well I cannot show much of what I really liked about this because uh, yeah there is not much to to see now but um it's worth to give it a try when the next elections come yeah the times has been doing it amazing job right like their database team is like a dream team uh, in the industry and yeah yeah their database is always really um, great um, indeed thank you i'm going to stop sharing now thank you sylvia thank um, you sylvia i really love the work of the new york times they have uh a dedicated at some point uh, i was able to to visit the team actually um and it's um it's a great combination of data scientists, designers, and journalists that work very, very closely together every day. And um, and I think uh, I would say the Economist and the New York Times are are very, very cutting edge. Um, so I think it's it's um, maybe we can even invite somebody from the team at some point and and present to us. Um, I think that'd be fun. Um, so we have five minutes left, but Juan just shared a link. Juan, do you want to come in and talk of, talk about why this is one of your favorites? Can you unmute yourself? Maybe not. <laughs> Sorry, guys, there are a lot of technical issues today. Hmm. Juan, are you up for this? I love the gap minded child and Hans yeah. Rosling is. Can out. you hear me can now? Hear yes. Yeah, yeah, we can hear you. All right. So, this is, uh, this is my favorite one. It's quite, uh, I mean, impressive the, the amount of um, data, but also the, the very easy and simple visualization where you can get at the glance like evolution over the time in 200 countries. Uh, in different uh, dimensions like uh, population and, and other other um, mm -hmm. um, I would say uh, indicators no connected to, to to social development it's quite amazing the, the the way that they put together this information there is actually a documentary that I will recommend to to watch on the story of the guy who created this and uh, and yeah this is amazing I I have a I have a question that now that I have the the the, the microphone, I've been following um, some uh, latest development on on artificial intelligence and ChatGPT and so on. There is one tool that is called Seek.ai, which is impressive because what you do is you connect this tool with your data set and you start asking questions. And then you get answers based on the data insights that this tool is uh, producing, basically, based on your data set. Is there a similar sort of solution for visualizations? Because I was wondering, it would be amazing that the visualization is coming out of a question that you make, no? And then it will suggest different types of visualizations based on your data set. Is, have, you, have you seen any, any tool like this one? 
Um, hi, Juan. Um, yeah, it's so fascinating what's going on in the AI space. Um, and um, I'm, I, I don't know Seek AI, but I'm going to check it out. Um, of course, I think looking with AI um, with a good degree of, of caution, uh, there's um, some developments in ChatGPT4. Uh, you can see it on the on the website of OpenAI also. So there is um, a new plugin where you can upload a data set and then and then ask it to produce visualizations, um, which um, might be something that what you have what you have in mind. You can ask it questions. Uh, now you know uh, I don't I don't know how well this is working in practice. Um, but um, but that is one use case. Um, I also know that Chalong um, has been experimenting with using ChatGPT for other uses. So um, when it comes to data visualization, so for example, asking ChatGPT of how to improve it, how to get the right kind of color scheme, how to edit the code. So um, even without coding, you can produce more complex data visualizations. So if uh, this is something that the group is interested in, we could we could have a session on on AI and data vis um, with a, with a caveat that we'll probably talk about the risks quite a bit as well though. But um, but I think it's a it's a fascinating space. Um, does that answer your does that answer your question? Yes, thank you very much. And we would love to have you present about your experiences in that case then too. So I'm gonna hire you for this if you're up for it. Um, Chalong, do you have do you want to say a little bit about your experimentation? I think you also have like a couple of slides on how you did that, right? Yeah. I don't know if I'm putting you on the spot too much here. And I know we only have a minute, but if people can stay in a, a couple of extra minutes, that'd be yep. great. Okay. And okay. if not, if for the people that have to leave at 10, um, I wanted to to thank everybody for coming. Uh, I wanted to thank Tomiko for her wonderful work in in, in doing this, this presentation and getting people together from not just uh, Infogram, but also a large communication Drupal community and beyond and everybody who contributed. So uh, thank you for that, but this isn't the end because maybe Chalong can tell us about his, his work on AI and data viz um, yeah. this year, yeah. with yeah, the nice. idea to have a larger session. Yeah. So, uh, can, uh, can you see my screen? Yeah. Yeah, OK. So the recent experience I had with with the help uh, by using the chat is to, uh, because recently I uh, we have a, uh, a demand to update a core diagram on our UNICEF website. But uh, the issue is that uh, I found the core diagram uh, I try to use different kinds of data visualization tools such as Flourish, Tableau, Power BI, Infogram, and it's found that I couldn't like uh, design a, like a single core, uh, a single core for each like uh, the mi migration migration from one uh, region to another. And finally, I found that it's possible to visualize it in uh, in one uh, Java-based platform called Observable. But the key issue is that uh, uh, I have no experience with JavaScripts. So then I think maybe I can try to ask for the help uh, from ChatGPT to see if uh, she can help me uh, uh, of that on it. And then, uh, so I start by understand uh, what's the, for example, what uh, ask chat to be, what is uh, observable, and could you help me understand how uh, it works? And it's turned out to be uh, 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 re to receive a very good explanation in detail about uh, about observable. And you can we can also, uh, for example, I'm also curious about the difference between like observable and uh, uh, other data visualization tools, and which we can also get a good understanding from that. And then I also did some tests that to see if ChatGPT could interpret the page with a core diagram on observable. And, uh, and in this step, I think ChatGPT still works well. It could uh, give us a very great explanation uh, about the chat and all the, also the coding uh, on that page. 
but in the next step, uh, then I'm thinking um, to do it more, uh, most efficiently is to ask ChatGPT to update the chat for, uh, with my data and also update the code for me directly. But it's turned out it's not currently the ChatGPT is not that mature that can help us to visualize the chat or update the whole uh, coding directly. It can hold a part of the code, but sometimes when if you have a long list of codes, then it will be uh, there will be an issue. So you have to do it a little uh, step by step. So I so in next I ask ChatGPT based on the coding of the previous uh, I found on one page. I like divide the coding part uh, step by step, uh, part, uh, one by one and ask ChatGPT to understand the code codes on the page. And also then uh, ask, uh, ask her to help me to uh, update the code, for example, to change the font of the, of the chat and also to find me where, how can I like adjust the data source or uh, adjust the color palette, palette for different region. But in this part, I think ChatGPT works well because finally I got, uh, I get the updated code from ChatGPT. And in the end, I, I adjust all the par parameters and um, make the chat align with UNICEF, UNICEF style. And that's how I recently I used to do the data visualization from ChatGPT. And uh, I also have some uh, inspiration from ChatGPT because, uh, for example, um, sometimes one we found that very interesting, like chat on what on any 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 source we want to. Uh, um, we might be curious how this chat designed, but sometimes um, then we can now we can use like as ChatGPT to interpret the page and uh, also ask how this chat designed them. For example, for this page, then I know that if they also use, they use the JavaScript uh, library to design this chat mm -hmm. and also the R, uh, pro, R language to visualize the chat. And also sometimes we can uh, ask ChatGPT to uh, to have some rec um, recommendation from ChatGPT of, of the visual of the chats we designed. But currently, I, I think the for re recommendation part is not that mature. <laughs> but normally they will give you some ge general ideas about about that. But it's great to have. Yeah, it's nice to have. And uh, yeah, that's all from my recent experience with Thank ChatGPT. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. So maybe that is something to go more in depth in at some point. Yeah. Right. Um, I think so. I was going to use the Mentimeter to do a quick survey about what people's interests are, but it's past ten. So I'm going to just send out um, a survey with the follow up email. If you could give us feedback about um, what you would like to learn in future sessions. Um, that would really help us greatly. Um, this, this, as you know, Caroline said in the beginning, is we're trying to build a community rather than try to just have this one-way um, sort of learning sessions from our team. Um, so, like, if you could let us know what you're interested in learning, or if you could impart your knowledge with us, that would be wonderful. So, um, and yeah, like everything that we share today. Um, we, we will include in the follow-up email and please do follow us on, on Yammer so that you will be uh, in the know about the future sessions. So Caroline, any other, Caroline Ocalon, any other last yeah, comments? Excellent. And thank you everyone. Yeah, thank you. Thank this you was great. Staying yeah. a little longer also. Yeah. We look forward to future sessions. Yeah. Thank you.